All right, so in 2 Kings chapter number 13, we're actually going to um, keep your finger here. We're going to read a little bit from 2 Kings chapter 10. We're going to see the promise made from to Jehu. Because what we see in chapter 13 here is a couple of Jehu's children. And we kind of see the same story just being repeated over and over again with his children. Now, I, I'm a pretty big fan of Jehu. I, I like the zeal that Jehu had. I like when he said, you know, come see my zeal for the Lord. And he drove furiously and he really got a lot of stuff done. Now, he's not the, the biggest hero in the Bible because he still decided not to follow God with all of his heart. You know, he did do some good works and God blessed him for it. And if, we're in, if you're in 2 Kings chapter 10, look at verse number 29. We'll just see uh, really quickly here. It says, How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not from after them, to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, and hast done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in mine heart, Thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. For he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. This is an important point. God, you know, it's, it's referenced here in chapter 10. Go back, if you would, to chapter 14. It's referenced there twice, just in a, in a couple verses. How he did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now, he did a lot of great things. And I'm not going to re-preach 2 Kings chapter 10, but in chapter 10, we saw that he you know, drove Baal out of Israel. He got rid of all the Baal worshipers and the prophets of Baal and kind of cleaned house in that regard. He got rid of the Satan worship and the, the false gods and the false idols, but he still had his own idols set up within, you know, I'll call it Christianity, right? Within Judaism, whatever, whatever you want to call the, the religion of serving the Lord at that time, he, um, he still had Jeroboam's sins of the, of the two golden, you know, the golden calves, the idols that were set up, and he didn't depart from those. He still was holding on to, a, you know, a remnant of his Catholicism or whatever you have that, that he just, he couldn't get out of, and he didn't have the desire. He said he took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He did a lot of great things for God, no doubt about that. And God blessed him for that too. That's why he said, hey, you're going to have four generations now on the throne. But because Jehu did not just seek God with all of his heart and did not, was not interested in walking in all the laws of the Lord with all of his heart, we see what happened to his children. Did they sit on the throne for four generations? Yes, they did. But what do you really have to speak for when you look at the lives of his four children, his four descendants that ended up sitting on the throne? What we see is a repeat of what was said about uh, Jehu. Look at um, chapter 14 here. Verse number, because we're going to see uh, uh, two of Jehu's, or, yeah, G Jehu's children. We have Jehoahaz which the exact same phrase is said of him. He did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and did not depart from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And then Jehoash, he did that which was evil and did not you know, depart from the sins of Jeroboam, which caused Israel to sin. And then he had a, another descendant, Jeroboam, same exact story. You see the same words referenced about his children, just all four of them. It's not a coincidence. It's not a coincidence that he didn't, you know, he was willing to do the other work and God bless him for it of getting, you know, the other wickedness out of Israel. But he still clung tight to the idolatry that, that he could not, he could not get rid of. He could not just follow all the laws of the Lord. And as a result, his children end up the same way. Look at verse number 23 here in 2 Kings 14. The Bible says, in the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, king of Israel began to reign in Samaria and reigned 40 and one years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. Now, I, pardon me because that was chapter 14 and that's Jeroboam. He's the third descendant. I added that in my notes. In uh, chapter 13, the other two descendants, I didn't make note of these, but it says... Um, Verse 1, 
in the three and twentieth year of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, king of Judah, Jehoahaz, the son of Jehu, began to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 17 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord and followed the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which made Israel to sin. He departed not therefrom. That was his first descendant. That was his first son. That he, he, he's, now, he did some good things, too, and he fought some good battles. But overall, when the Bible is talking about his reign, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he still followed after the, the, the sins of, of Jeroboam and son of Nebat. And then his son, in verse number 10, says, In the thirty and seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reign sixteen years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked therein. The same phrase we already read, 2 Kings 14, verses 23 and 24, about the third descendant. And then in turn if you go to chapter 15, verse number 8, Zechariah is the last descendant. He's the fourth heir of, of Jehu, which was promised to be on the throne. Verse number 8, the Bible reads, In the thirty and eighth year of Azariah, king of Judah, did Zechariah, the son of Jeroboam, reign over Israel and Samaria six months, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, as his fathers had done, he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. The same phrases are being used to describe every single one of those, and it's not by accident. Now look, it's not an excuse for any one of these men to say, oh, that's how I was brought up. But at the same token, as a parent, as a man, someone who's going to have descendants and children, the way that you live your life and the beliefs that you follow is going to have a big impact on your children. And we need to make sure that we are doing the best we can for our children so we aren't just raising generation after generation of people who just don't want to get rid of their idols. See, I think if Jehu would have, would have gone all the way in for God and just, I mean, he had this great zeal. But if he could have added maybe a little bit more knowledge to that deal or been more willing to just get, get the rest of that junk, don't be clinging on to any of your idolatry, just get rid of it all and completely sell out for God, his children would have turned out different. I firmly believe that just from, from the way that these, are, these, these, these phrases are brought up, I mean, identically. And ultimately, having his children being on the throne for four generations... What does that accomplish if they're still into idolatry and if, if they're still doing evil in the sight of the Lord? It really doesn't matter that much. Verse number 12 then in chapter 15 says, This was the word of the Lord which he spake unto Jehu, saying, Thy son shall sit on the throne of Israel unto the fourth generation. And so it came to pass. Of course, God always keeps his promises. So when God promised that, hey, you're going to have four generations after you on the throne of Israel. I mean, at the time, he's probably thinking, hey, that's great. Praise God, you know, we're going to have a strong line. I'm going to have, you know, my sons are going to do a great thing. And, and that's not the way it turned out because it started off with Jehu not being willing to, uh, to get rid of that idolatry and, and really seek after. You know, it wasn't just idolatry. It was just, you know, ultimately what it is is, is his heart not wanting to fully follow after the Lord. And that's what's referenced. It says, that uh, Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. He was kind of a half in, half out type of a Christian, type of a believer. I, and that's what I think. When I, when I read this story, what jumps out to me is something that's kind of representative of Jehu and his descendants is that of lukewarm Christianity. That, yeah, they may be saved, right? They may be believers, but they're unwilling to give up their worldliness, their own idols, whatever it is that they like to have to serve, and, and, and they kind of want the best of both worlds, so to speak, as opposed to just going all in and saying, you know what, I'm not going to love the things of this world because every, all that is in this world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And that, and that any man that loveth the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And this is the attitude that we need to have towards this world and not try to be mixing and, and having it both ways, so to speak. And it's, and it's just going to end up ultimately in disaster. I mean, his children, 
as you read, and, and we'll see this in 2 Kings 14 and 15, it's almost like they get worse and worse. There's, there's, in, in the sense that there's less and less good being said about these kings. We have two of them just in chapter 13 where we're at tonight where their lives are covered and that's it. And they are not even recorded in the Chronicles. Like this is, this is all we have of Jehu's descendants. Like these two kings, chapter 13, that's it. There's no supporting scriptures to find out like more about them in God's word. So um, let's go back to chapter 13. Because we're going to segue off of that point of them kind of representing this lukewarm type of Christianity and, uh, with another point that's a parenthetical statement here in chapter 13. Look at verse number 3. We'll keep reading here. The Bible says, And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he delivered them into the hand of Hazael, king of Syria, and into the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, all their days. So God's angry. Why is God angry? Because the king's still doing evil and not getting rid of the idolatry. That's why, because that's what you just mentioned, verses 1 and 2. Verse 4, And Jehoahaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed him. Now, before I even go any further, I do think that these men probably were saved. They're probably believers. I mean, we see here that, I mean, I'm pretty confident Jehu was. He, you know, he said, come see my zeal for the Lord, right? Uh, he, t he seemed to be relying on God. He seemed to know the scripture. He seemed to, to wanting to be fulfill God's word. Even though he didn't fully seek it with all of his heart, there's nothing that would indicate to me that Jehu wasn't a believer. His son here now, yeah, he did, he's, he's kind of mixed up the same way his dad was. But when things get really bad, he's still turning to God. Right? That's what it says. Joaz besought the Lord, and the Lord hearkened unto him, for he saw the oppression of Israel because the king of Syria oppressed them. So because of him not really fully following the Lord, they're being oppressed. But then when he turns to God, God's like, yeah, you, you are being oppressed, and I'm going to relieve that oppression and send a deliverer, some, you know, someone to help you out here so that you're not being oppressed anymore because they turn to him, because they humble themselves and turn to God and say, God, please help us. Because that's what God is looking for. Look at verse number five. This is the parenthetical statement. The Bible says, And the Lord gave Israel a Savior, so that they went out from under the hand of the Syrians, and the children of Israel dwelt in their tents as before time. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam, who made Israel sin but walked therein, and there remained the grove also in Samaria. You're going to find in this chapter and the next couple chapters to come, this is a sticking point. This is something I believe that get, that's getting God very angry is that they're still not getting rid of the groves. They're not getting rid of the high places. They're not getting rid of the idolatry. You need to just completely do away with what Jeroboam had done. But we see here also this, this type of an attitude, this happens all the time. This is a type of a salvation where we see people who the Lord gives them a savior. And did God save Israel from, from Hazael and the Syrians? Sure, he did because he saw they were being oppressed and they turned to God and what did God do? He saved them. He brought up, he raised up a savior. Did that automatically then just move the hearts of everybody so that now they were just fully following the Lord with all their heart? Nope. Should they have? Absolutely. I mean, wouldn't you, doesn't it sound kind of ridiculous to not be following the God and his laws with all of their hearts after he just saved them? Would, isn't that what you would expect? Well, if he really saved them, then they would be more gracious. No, they should be more gracious. They obviously weren't. Nevertheless, they departed not from the sins of the house of Jeroboam. So just because they weren't gracious enough, they weren't diligent enough, they weren't zealous enough to really follow God, to really go after his commandments, doesn't mean they didn't get saved. We see this happen all the time. Receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior spiritually is easy. 
easy to call upon the name of the Lord and get saved. It requires zero work because salvation is of grace and not of works. And just as in the case here, Israel as a nation was brought really low because they were being oppressed. And they were brought so low and being hammered so hard that they just turned to God. Because they realized at that point they're powerless. And this is the way that, sal that spiritual salvation works in many people's lives as well. Unfortunately, in order for people to be humble enough to admit that I'm not good enough to go to heaven, that I can't earn it on my own, there's no amount of good deeds that I can do that's going to make me worthy of being in the presence of the Lord. To get to that state, unfortunately, some people need to be brought really, really, really low in their life to realize, I need someone to save me. I need a Savior. But thank God that God does bring people low enough to get saved. Because I'd rather be brought that low in my life and receive salvation than never be brought low and not be saved. But this happens every day. People get brought down really low in their life and realize that, hey, I need a Savior. And they turn to God, and God saves them. God has already given us a Savior. He's already there. We just need to accept it. And once we do, they get saved. They receive eternal life. Praise the Lord. But you know what? For many of those people that even get brought low, you would think you've been brought so low, and it's a result of your sins, it's a result of you living a wicked life, and God has gotten you now to this place, and you're humble, and you realize you need a Savior, and you realize what He's done for you and how much God loves you. You would think that those people from that point on, when they receive that free gift and they're thankful for it, that they would turn their whole life around and devote their entire existence to serving the God that saved them and loved them. You think that that would happen. And you know what? That should happen. But it doesn't in many, many cases, in many situations. But that doesn't make these people unsaved. It doesn't mean they didn't receive that Savior. It's just like the, the lepers, the ten lepers that came to, to Jesus and he healed them. And only one of them turned around and was thankful for it. Just one. You should think that they'd all be thankful, that they'd all return to him and be like, oh, wow, thank you. You're the great power of God. You've healed us. I'm going to follow you now because obviously you're of God. Is that what happened? Nope. Were they still healed though? Yep. And this is the, this is, this is the, the nonsense it's interesting because I've been receiving a lot of, a lot of comments lately on the, the Potter's House sermon that I preached. I don't even remember. I mean, it's probably been about a year ago. I, I don't know exactly when I preached that. It's been a while, though. It's funny how the YouTube videos do that, though. So, somehow they get picked up somewhere or another, and then it's like you start getting all these views and comments and stuff. But I've been getting these comments on the, on the Potter's House stuff, and it's just the same old stuff. And because they preach a false gospel which is exactly, I think, what the, the sermon that I preached was titled, like, The Potter's House Perverts the Gospel of Jesus Christ. And they're doing work for Satan because they're not preaching salvation by grace through faith Amen. alone. Because they take the mentality of, well, if you're really saved, then you would depart from your sins. And they take the, the attitude of, well, you need to keep obeying God and, and getting all this sin out of your life, or else... You're no longer saved. And that's a false gospel. Just because you see someone that hasn't departed from their sins doesn't mean that they weren't already saved, that they didn't receive a Savior. But there's going to be a lot more to come on that coming soon. I don't want to spend too much time on that tonight. Let's keep reading in 2 Kings chapter 13. It's just Jehum and his descendants, right, I believe are kind of representative of this, this lamestream Christianity where they're getting some things done and Jehu got some things done, but then like his followers and his descendants, I think are just getting more and more lame and watered down and actually just doing more wickedness because Jehu wasn't actually actively like 
he wasn't um, regarded as he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, right? He did good in the eyes of the Lord, and that's how his life was, was characterized in chapter 10. But he didn't fully do all that he could have done. He could have done, he, he left a lot lacking. But then when it comes to his descendants, right away, they, they're, they're being characterized as they did evil in the sight of the Lord. Not like their father. But you have one guy who's actually doing, did a good work, but still kind of lame in the end, didn't, didn't go all the way in. Now his children are actually doing evil and continuing in the same sins of their father. But um, let's keep reading here. Verse number 7, uh, chapter 13. Neither did he leave of the people to Jehoahaz, but 50 horsemen and 10 chariots and 10,000 footmen for the king of Syria had destroyed them and had made them like the dust by threshing. So what that's saying, though, is that, that God gave them a savior and God delivered them but he didn't leave them with much. They still were decimated. They still, you know, militarily, their strength was diminished really small and God was keeping them, trying to keep them humble. But he did deliver them. Now, verse number eight says, now the rest of the acts of Jehoahaz and all that he did and his might, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? And Jehoahaz slept with his fathers and they buried him in Samaria. And Joash, his son, reigned in his stead. In the 30 and seventh year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoahaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reign 16 years. Now, I know I brought this up in the past, but just I want you to keep this in your mind as you're reading your Bibles, especially in this section of the kings. You have Joram, you have Jehoram, same name. You have Joash, you have Jehoash, same name. So don't let that throw you off, but just be aware of it. But then also be aware that there are other kings oftentimes with the same name. <laughs> and you'll have Joram, Jehoram, and they're both being used for both of the kings of Judah and Israel while they're reigning at the same time. So just try to be very careful when you're reading the scripture. And also, always be paying attention to what's going on and don't just speed read to just check off that I've done my reading for the day when you're reading God's word. Because you will, you, it can actually be dangerous and can confuse you and cause you just to have wrong thoughts and ideas about what the Bible's saying. Because in most places, it's pretty um, you know, chronological. It's pretty straightforward. There's many stories where you're not going to get necessarily mixed up on things. But in here, it's a lot easier to do. And specifically in this chapter, what you're going to see is, see, when God wants to cover certain topics and kind of make a point, um, a certain chronology will be used to, to talk about that topic, which then, you know, you could, you could jump forward and then, as you're reading, go back in time again to provide more details or another story or more insight into something that's already been covered. So we see that happen actually in this chapter. It goes over the life of the first two descendants of Jehu, Jehoahaz and Joash. And then it goes back after, and, and says here, well, let's keep reading here because this is where we're at. Uh, I think we're left off around verse number 10. Uh, in the 30 and 7th year of Joash, king of Judah, began Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, to reign over Israel and Samaria and reigned 16 years. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, but he walked therein. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did and his might wherewith he fought against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? And Joash slept with his fathers, and Jeroboam sat upon his throne, and Joash was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel. So this makes sense because the Bible is giving you just, just really quickly these first two descendants of Jehu and just the length of the reign. They did evil, and I think it's to point out and kind of highlight that they did evil and they followed after the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. He did evil, followed after the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and to get that all real quickly in context here, and then just say, and he died. And just kind of pointing out that there's really not a whole lot to say about these people's lives. Now, we are going to see where Amaziah goes to fight against Joash in Second Chronicles. That, that is covered. We're, I mean, we're not going to go into that, but 
that is covered. But it's, it's the point being made as to why he goes all the way through to Joash's de death and then talks about Jeroboam being next. But it doesn't then continue on telling us anything about Jeroboam, but then goes back to Joash's life as we continue on in this chapter. So the reason why I'm even pointing out is just to say pay attention because if you're just going really quickly, you could be just thinking like, okay, Joash is dead, now where are we at? And you, you know, you'll find that it's not even just, and this is kind of a real minor occurrence of this, but when you read in Judges and you read in other places in the Bible, there's actually, um, it's not all chronological. You'll find it going back pretty far and, and, and being at different points in history, and you really got to be paying attention to that. So um, just keep that in mind. I know sometimes we get to a point to where I'm just trying to make sure that I'm doing my daily activities for God, you know, whether it be praying and reading and things that, that, that you've decided that you want to make sure you're doing to maintain your, your spiritual level and even to grow. But don't let it become this, this burden where I just got to get through it, where you're just checking off the box, especially when it, comes to, you know, when it comes to your praying. You should be praying for people earnestly and honestly and thinking about them and not just chanting through some, some words that you have to just repeat over and over again just to make sure, okay, I prayed to God today. And it's the same thing with your Bible reading, that you're reading to receive and to hear from God not to just have your eyes glaze over the words and say, I read my chapter today or whatever. It's better for you and more important to read less with understanding than to read more without getting anything from it. And that's a pretty simple concept, but uh, just try to keep that in mind. You know, a lot of people get, get caught up in these goals, which I love goals and goals are great. So please don't misinterpret what I'm saying but of wanting to say, I've read through the Bible four times cover to cover this year, but then their, their comprehension really suffers because they're, not, uh, they're just concerned of how fast can I get through these chapters. Don't fall into that trap. You don't have to be hyper-spiritual to say, I've read the Bible this many times because someone, if that's all you're thinking about, Someone that's read the Bible half as many times as you could know way more because they actually spent the time to understand what they're, you know, think about and, and be concerned about what they're reading. Let it sink in. Pay attention to the details and don't skip over them. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 14. We're going to see this, this cool little, it's almost a par parenthetical story here. Um, Actually, no, that's a little bit later, but this, we're, we're going back to Elisha. Now, Elisha's at the end of his life. Verse number 14 says, Now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him. And again, we see Joash was the one, he, he's, uh, he's seeking the man of God. He's not going to Baal. He's actually going to the right person here. And, and this is another reason why I think, to use the sentence, we're probably saved. I mean, they're, 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 at the end of the day, they are going to the Lord. They are seeking out God. But overall, their lives are characterized by doing evil. So here we have Joash going to Elisha. It says, now Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness, wherever he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now, this phrase was used, if you remember, with Elisha and Elijah, when Elijah was carried to heaven by the chariot and, and in the whirlwind going up into heaven. And basically what he's saying, you know, by this phrase is because Elisha's about to die. You know, he said, my, uh, Eli you know, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Like you're about to be taken from me and be taken to heaven, basically, is, is what, that, what he's saying there. Verse number 15, and Elisha said unto him, take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. Now, 
Elisha here is clearly having him do what he's telling him to do as it's representing a blessing from God, right? He's telling him, hey, shoot, you know, first he says, take the bow, take the bow and arrows, right? And when he grabs them, then Elisha is putting his hands over the hands of Joash because he's, he's, he's giving him a blessing. And then he's like, okay, open up the window, take the bow, you know, shoot, shoot out the window. So he listens to everything he says, he does it, and then he explains, okay, now, you know, basically, just as you've shot that arrow, um, he says, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria because they've been oppressed by Syria, by Hazael, by Ben-Hadad, that, that they've been receiving this oppression from Syria. He's saying, you know what? God's going to deliver you. The Lord's going to deliver you. Thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. So that's great news. You know, and, and obviously, this is why Joash is even coming to Elisha. He's coming and, and, and coming to the man of God and trying to turn to God and seeking out that Savior and seeking out help. So Elisha blesses him and he says, okay, you did all these things. I just, just like I told you to do. And you did these things and God's going to bless you now. Um, and what's also, if you remember, when Elisha himself right before Elijah was going to be taken from him and he was going to die, you know, he was going to be taken to heaven. It's a very similar situation because Elisha asked Elijah for that double portion, right? Like he's going to him as kind of like this last request before he dies. Well, that's what Joash is doing here with like sort of like his last request before Elisha dies. And, and, and Elisha is imparting something, a blessing to Joash, just as Elijah imparted a blessing to Elisha. Now, obviously, Elisha got a much better blessing because he was actually, you know, a godly man and, and someone who was looking to serve the Lord. But um, nonetheless, let's keep reading here. Verse number 18, and he said, take the arrows. And he took them, and he said unto the king of Israel, smite upon the ground, and he smote thrice and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. And I remember when I used to read this, I would wonder, why did Elisha get wroth? Wroth means like having wrath, which is, which is pretty angry. right? He got really angry with the king when he took the arrow, because he said, take the arrows and hit them on the ground. So he took the arrows and he went and stopped. And as I read this story, I remember thinking like, well, why, why would he be angry about that? I mean, he didn't tell him how many times to hit with the arrows, right? Like, you tell him to hit the arrows, he hit the arrows. Or, you know, what, what's the big deal? Well, First of all, you know, because I, I was thinking, like, how could he know that that was going to represent how many times you're going you're gonna to defeat the Syrians? Well, here's how, because he already went to him, and the whole point of him going to Elisha was, like, for a blessing, and he's already been acting out these various things that are representative of the blessings that he's just been receiving. He just had to open up the window and shoot the arrow, and then he's saying that arrow that you just shot is the deliverance of the Lord. You know what I mean? So what he got angry about is... Again, I think representative of his being this lamestream Christian where, you know, you're told to do something and you're just looking to do maybe the minimum. Like, okay, I hit it on the ground. No, when you're told to do something, he's like, just do it. You know, do it with fervor. If you're looking for that blessing, give it all you have. You know, you should have smelt it five, six, seven. You know, I mean, if you would have just been like, all right, you want me to hit these arrows? So then he would have defeated the Syrians completely. And what this is demonstrating is his lack of heart. It's a lack of heart that you had to follow the Lord completely, and it's a lack of heart that his descendants had, that Joash had here. That, yes, he didn't like being oppressed, but who would? Yes, he turned to the Lord, which is the right answer. But his heart really wasn't in it. He just wanted to be delivered, and that's it. He just wanted to hear him say, okay, I'll save you, but didn't really want to give anything back. He didn't really want to give 
and, and, um, and, and really be zealous to serve God and, and to do what's right. He went to Elisha knowing well that he was a prophet. And especially, too, you got to remember this, you know, we read these stories and it's a little bit more foreign for us on how they behave and how the prophets behave and how, you know, like how there's so much symbolism and the things that they do. But look at what Ezekiel did. You know, look at what God had so many prophets do. Look at what he had Hosea do. He had a prophet, you know, marry a woman of whoredoms and, you know, and, and, and name them certain names. And, and it's all representative. He had Ezekiel, you know, he was like laying down on the ground naked and he had to like eat cow's dung and like do all kinds of things that we, I mean, that's really foreign to us. But for the way that God was using his prophets, especially in the Old Testament, that wasn't that foreign, that they would, they, they would do things that were a little bit different, but they were very representative. So what I'm saying is that, you know, when, when Joash went to him, he would have had a different understanding of how the prophet works, of how Elisha kind of dealt with things than we do. And he already was, was receiving that with the whole arrow thing. So, um, What I think we could totally take away from this, though, is, is not to do things half-heartedly. Don't try to just do the minimum. Don't, try, don't just, you know, if God wants you to do something, well, how much do I really have to do that? And that's all I'm going to do. Because will it work? To some degree, it will. You know, I mean, it's not like, you know, if you do any work for the Lord, it's going to return void or vain. And what happened here was, yeah, the three times that he hit the, the arrows on the ground, he defeated Sir, Syria three times in three battles. And they were important battles. And, and, and that was, you know, that, that was a good thing, of course. So, so good came out of it for sure. But he's saying you should have just given it more. You should have just given it all that you had because then you would have had great victory. Then you would have had great blessings. Then you would have had great rewards. Elizabeth, turn around and face forward. Even when God is blessing you and fighting your battles for you, you still have to give it all that you have. Because God was the one that was saving him, right? And we see with uh, King David and, and many other situations where they're completely relying on the Lord to fight their battles for him, they still go out and will give it all that they have. Another example that, that when I was studying for this for the sermon tonight, made me think of, of a story in Joshua 7 when they just defeated Jericho. Turn, if you would, there, if you would, to Joshua 7 real quickly. Because one of the problems is it's too easy to get this attitude of coasting in our Christian life and, and not giving it our all, right? You still may be doing good things. You're still, still doing you know, those good works. You've you smote the arrows a few times, and, you, and you'll be blessed for that. Because, you know, God will bless you. you know, the work that you do, whatever work you do, He's going to bless you for that. But it's, it's, it's not comparable to just giving it everything. Right? When you, when you really give it all, God really multiplies the, the blessings that, that you receive for that. And we see here, so what happened in Joshua was that they had this great victory that God wrought for them. Right? Remember, they compassed the, the city seven times or on, you know, for seven days, and then on the seventh day, they compassed the city seven times, and then the walls came, you know, they made the shout, they sounded the trumpets, the walls just came crumbling down miraculously, this great stronghold, this great strong city of Jericho. Who could penetrate Jericho? Well, God just made the walls crumble to the ground. And the children of Israel were obedient. And then they went in, and they finished the battle, and they did what they were supposed to do, you know, and then the next battle was against Ai, the next city that they were going to fight. And look at what they said. Look at verse number two in Joshua 7. The Bible says, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside beth -Avon, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up. But let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. 
So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and six men, for they chased them from before the gate, even unto Shebarim, and smote them in the going down, wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Now look, I know that the main cause for their defeat here is because Achan took of the accursed thing when they defeated Jericho, which God told them they're not to take anything, not to touch the accursed thing. It's all going to be destroyed, and it's all the Lord's because that was their first battle, their first victory, and the first goes unto God, and that's the way that God said he wanted to be done. Achan didn't do that. As a result, God's not with them, and these men of Ai now are defeating them, but I don't think that that's the only thing going on there. Now, that is the primary reason. I'm not going to say it's not because the scripture says so. But what we see here is this attitude from them saying, well, we just got this great victory. Don't make everybody work. Don't make everybody go out and labor. You know, they're just a few people. Let's just send a few thousand people down there. And they start getting this arrogant attitude. Well, let's, let's not make people actually do the work. Let's just send out a few people to do the work. Let's let everyone else just relax and sit here and, and not do anything. When they all ought to have been to the work. God's called all of us to do work. Don't just rely on, well, we've got a couple people doing the work. That's good enough for me. I'm just going to coast on the coattails of the blessing that's going to come by the work that these people are doing and I don't have to do anything. It's a, it's a bad attitude to have, and actually God can choose not to bless because everyone's not, you know, because, because there's not this willingness and the spirit to, to, to get, put everyone to the work. Let's go back, if you would, to 2 Kings chapter 13. 2 Kings chapter 13. Try to stay on fire. Retain that, that zeal that, that, you know, like Jehu had to just go out and serve God and, and try to give it everything that you have. Let's keep reading here in verse number 20. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men. And they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. Now this is a really cool little story here because it's kind of just thrown in here. But um, basically what happens is that the Moabites are invading Israel. And as there's just this group of guys that, that you know, someone had died, maybe in battle, maybe not, it's not clear, but they're going to bury this guy. And then they see the Moabites are right there. So they have to like hurry up and get out of there. They don't have time to do a procession. They don't have time to even dig this guy uh, his own grave. They're like, oh, there they are. We need to get out of here. So they're like, hey, here's, here's a tomb right here. Let's, let's just throw him in here and get out of here. So they lower him down. It happened to be Elisha's sepulcher, Elisha's, Elisha's grave. And they lower him down into there. And when the guy hits Elisha's bones, he comes back to life. The guy they are trying to bury then comes back to life. And, that, and that's a really, I mean, it's kind of a weird story. It's, like I said, it's, it's, it's almost just like thrown in here. Now, what I've heard before, I haven't gone through and, um, and verified this on my own. You remember when Elisha asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit to be upon him? I've heard it said, and you might want to check this out for yourself, um, but I've heard it said that Elisha did twice as many miracles that are recorded in Scripture than Elijah did. So Elijah did a lot of things, right? Remember, he helped the widow woman, and, and the, you know, the oil didn't fail, and the meal didn't fail, you know, and, and all the various uh, miracles that occurred through Elijah. Well, I was told that Elisha had done twice as much, and up to this point, he had done one less than twice as much, and then when, when this happened, this is like the, the last one that makes it exactly twice as many miracles being done. I think that's kind of cool. It sounds great, but um, I can't say for sure that that's, that that's a fact. But um, it, it is interesting enough to, to kind of look up 
and check out. I didn't have enough time to go back and verify all of that and count the miracles, but um, if you're so inclined, uh, let me know what you find out. But continuing on here, so we have, we have that little story where the guy just revived by, just by touching the, the bones of Elisha, the man of God. Verse number 22, but Hazael, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz, and the Lord was gracious unto them and had compassion on them and had respect unto them because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. So Hazael, king of Syria, died, and Ben-Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. And Jehoash, the son of Jehoaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazael, the cities which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father, by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. So that's the, the, the fulfillment of the prophecy from Elisha when he was dying, when he smote the arrows three times on the ground. Well, now he was able to recover these three cities as opposed to completely eliminating Syria from being a problem from them had he you know, hit those arrows multiple times and really put his heart into it and really cared about it enough to go forward no, he just, but he did recover these three cities. So still, it's a good thing. He did a small work, he had a small gesture, and, and he received a small blessing for it. But um, the, the last thing I just want to bring up about this whole, about everything we're reading here is this theme that kind of comes up regularly of um, the impact that one individual can have for generations to come. And I preach an entire sermon on this, how, how, you know, you need to remember that you individually can have a great impact on this world, on this area, on many people to come after you. And don't get caught up in the mindset that of, of this, who am I? I can't do anything. In one sense, that's true. But if you are willing to devote your life to serving God and just, and just, saying, here am I, Lord, send me. God can use you to do many great things. And that's what these men did, that the repercussions of their actions and their faith and what they did with that faith has, has gone forward to many, many generations. It brings up here the reason why God's not destroying Israel, even though they're still doing wickedly, even though they are still got idolatry and everything else going wrong. He says, you know what? Because of the covenant I made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All three of those men are brought up so many times throughout the Bible as being men of God that had a lot of faith, that acted on that faith. And as a result, and David, and even Jehu, the, the actions that they did carried forward for many generations. But then we also see the actions of people who do wickedly carrying forward like Jeroboam the son of Nebat for many generations. I mean, if people don't have that to follow, they'd have to come up with it on their own. You know what I mean? And that's a lot harder to do. It's easier for people to follow along in the path of sin than to trailblaze their own path of sin. Jeroboam trailblazed when he set up those idols. He actually did, you know, really acted out to create those idols. Everyone else along the way just didn't remove them. They just kind of followed along that path. Whereas Jehu probably wouldn't have been going and setting up golden calves if they didn't already exist. Yet he didn't get rid of them. And those actions, good and bad, and continue forward for a real long time. Keep that in mind and think about that for the good. Don't think that, you know, hey, what can I do? What can I really accomplish? You can accomplish a lot. God can choose to use anybody that's willing to give of themselves to have many great things be done even after you're gone from here to continue forward. But it takes work. It, it, you can't be the lame Christian that's only going to smite the arrows three times. you got to be willing to give it all if you, if you want to have those great results. If you want little results, you can put in a little. If you want great results, put in a lot. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. 
Dear Lord, we thank you so much for all these uh, great stories that we get to read from your word. Um, I love these, these books and reading about the various kings and the trials and, and tribulations and the victories that, that you've wrought through various people. Dear Lord, I pray that you please help us to emulate these heroes of the faith and, um, and help us to, to model ourselves after their strengths and, and to learn from all their weaknesses and, their, and the areas that um, they didn't do as well with. Dear Lord, help us to make the application in our own life. God, help us to be spiritually minded and, and know that we, we, even though we know us individually, especially in our own strength, we're nothing, but that if we're willing to give ourselves that you can use anyone, you could use us to have many great things done and to bring honor and glory to your name and, and bring a blessing upon generations to come, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to stay fervent in our desire to serve you and that we would, um, you know, just be completely sold out in, in our service to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.